And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Dr. Jeff Tarrant, and he is the founder and director of Psychic Mind Science and the Neuromeditation Institute in Eugene, Oregon. He's a licensed psychologist and board certified in neurofeedback. Dr. Tarrant is also the author of the book, Meditation Interventions to Rewire the Brain. And in addition, his upcoming book is called Becoming Psychic. And Dr. Jeff, is it, is it published yet or is it upcoming? I'm not sure about that. Um, it will be released November 7th. All right. So I had it right. All right. Well, great. Yep. Well, thank you for being here and we really appreciate having you today. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate uh, your invitation. Mm -hmm. All right. So where I want to start is about your own personal journey, because you were a believer in the paranormal, then you became a skeptic, and now you're open-minded to it. So (laughs) what happened? (laughs) Well, you know, I I guess, you know, if if we want to go all the way back to my childhood, um, you know, I was very much interested in anything weird. Uh, so, you know, Bigfoot and the Loch Ness monster and, uh, UFOs and aliens and, um, you know, telekinesis. Uh, so anything like that was really what grabbed my attention and that continued for really a long time. And, you know, through early adolescence and, you know, it took different forms, of course, as I got older. Um, but it was just an interest. It was just something that you know, I I was attracted to. Um, But it wasn't like I had any special abilities or anything that I was aware of at that time. I I just was interested. Um, And then, you know, if we want to fast forward a bit, uh, really, it was graduate school. I'm a I'm a psychologist. And I I kind of blame my training as a psychologist for uh, essentially kind of training uh, that way of thinking out of me. Uh, you know, really kind of developing much more of a skeptical attitude and, you know, a feeling that a lot of these beliefs and thoughts and even experiences were sort of delusions, Um, you know, to sort of, I'm saying it in a little bit of an extreme way, but that humans are good at, you know, making stuff up and (laughs) believing all kinds of things, whether they're true or not. And, And so that was kind of the orientation that I sort of developed was that, yeah, you know, that would be cool if all of this stuff was true, but the reality is we're just humans and we're, we're, you know, we're just kidding ourselves. You know, it's, it's some sort of, you know, defense mechanism, uh, some belief in a higher power and something special or something, you know, beyond ourselves. And, and that maintained for a while, um, you know, until, you know, after I got out of graduate school and, uh, you know, kind of really developed an interest in spirituality. And that's really what was the turning point, I think, was when I became more interested in, you know, more Eastern ideas, uh, you know, philosophic, philosophic ideas. So I was really attracted to more Buddhist and Hindu kinds of ways of thinking. and. Uh, you know, that really pushed me toward learning how to meditate, you know, because again, it was it was all academic at this point, it was just reading about these things. And, and then as I started to meditate and started to, you know, learn more and experience more of my own internal world, and learn how to navigate that, and sort of open my mind to the possibility that there is more, there is more than just us living in this physical meat suit, uh, kind of wandering around. And, and so it, it was kind of a slow, gradual progression of, you know, from meditation to exploring Qigong and yoga, which really started uh, expanding the way that I thought about energy, because I, I was experiencing it. And so really, my, my initial work in this field was around energy healing because it was sort of a natural branch from Qigong and, and those kinds of practices. Um, and so from there, that just really opened my mind to the possibility that, 
okay, maybe I had it right to begin with. <laughs> maybe, maybe the way I was thinking as a kid was actually more accurate than kind of what my training uh, led me to believe. And then really, it just kind of, you know, as the universe does it, it, you know, it kind of puts things in your path uh, that maybe you were, you know, you weren't necessarily looking for, but become important. And so that's what happened about 11 years ago, where, you know, I had the opportunity to start studying. And by studying, I mean, looking at the brains, brainwave functioning of some psychics and mediums. And once I kind of really fully got into that world and started interacting with more of these people and testing them, both for their skill, but also for what was going on in their brain, um, you know, at some point, you know, you almost can't be a skeptic anymore. It's it's like, there's just too much. I, you see too much, you experience too much for it to not be real. Um so, you know, then that's just kind of developed over time to where now my passion is trying to understand how this works so that those of us that don't, maybe don't consider ourselves a psychic or a medium or an energy healer, you know, how can we learn to access those same abilities, uh, even if we don't necessarily think we have a natural propensity for that? So along the way, did you ever have some sort of spiritually transformative experience I, yes. Um, so what I'll say is that with all my training in meditation, I wouldn't say that any of it felt particular, particularly spiritually transformative in terms of I, I didn't enter some sort of special state of consciousness where I felt unity with the world or with the universe. That never really happened for me with meditation, uh, even though I've been meditating for a long time. Um, but what did change for me was some uh, different psychedelic experiences where, um, you know, really there have been several of them that have been very impactful uh, where, you know, one in particular, the one that was probably started a lot of this for me was uh, experiencing, I don't know what else I could call it, except feeling like I was being held by some sort of goddess energy. And it, it was the most loving, the, the love was so intense. Um, I, you know, there's no way you can even describe it. Uh, just the most intense, selfless love you could ever imagine. And even in that moment, I sort of had the awareness that what I was experiencing was the tiniest fraction of what was available. And, and it was almost like I couldn't handle any more. Right. It's like, well, here, we'll give you this. But this is just like a speck of what is possible. And that experience was so intense for me. Uh, it changed it changed my life, actually, in several ways that, you know, it led me to leave my position <laughs> at the University of Missouri and pursue other things uh, and really start to explore spirituality in a different way. Who do you think this goddess was? You know, that's a great question. Um, and I don't know. Uh, it, it wasn't like it had a name or a form specifically. Um, it was more of a felt sense and uh, an experience. Um, and, you know, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what, uh, you know, if we wanted to kind of give it a you know, a designation, I don't know what it would be, but it definitely felt feminine. That's the only reason I could sort of call it a goddess because the energy was so big. It, it wasn't, it couldn't, it couldn't have possibly been something less than a very powerful being or energy. And maybe it was just an energy. I don't know. And maybe those are the same things. Um, you know, so I, I did, I, I didn't get a specific, which is kind of a bummer. I would have liked to have had a uh, you know, <laughs> if it was Quan Yin or something, right? And I had something to kind of attach to. Um, but maybe that's part of the lesson as well that I was receiving is that, you know, maybe it doesn't have to be, you don't have to give it a name. Uh, it doesn't have to be limited in that way. Um, which is actually something that I've been 
you know, thinking a lot about recently, but some of it is my own experience too, but is that, you know, the way that language limits things. And then when we put a label on something, we've, we've changed it and we've limited its potential, you know, by giving it a label. And, you know, that's hard for us. That's hard for humans. You know, we like to know what we're talking about and we like to talk. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Did she perhaps at least feel familiar to you, like you knew this person in some sort of way? Um, no, it was a totally new experience. Um, I mean, of course, I've felt love before, but nothing, you know, I mean, this is one of the first times probably in the last, you know, 10 years that I've been able to talk about it without bursting into tears, because it was so impactful that it just stays with you, you know, it just, um, you know, very intense, you know. Are you saying that the memory of this experience has never faded? I mean, it's faded for sure, but, um, but it's, it's still, it's still really intense, just kind of reconnecting with whatever freckle of a, you know, memory I still have of what that was like. Um, you know, I've never felt anything like that before that I'm aware of, that I have a conscious memory of, uh, or since. I've had some other pretty interesting experiences, but not like that. Now, you mentioned this was a psychedelic experience. Does that mean like you were taking plant medicines or like, like ayahuasca or DMT or something? Yeah, this was in an ayahuasca ceremony. Okay. Yep. And then, you know, I've had some other really powerful spiritual experiences with ketamine. Um, wow. And yeah, and those those have been different, but but perhaps equally powerful, just in different ways. Um, I've had a guest once that she had a near-death experience, or at least a near-death-like experience with ketamine. And I think the person who administered it had figured out the dosage to give to actually get that experience. Yeah, there's um, there's actually a, a, a decent amount of literature looking at what kind of dosages with ketamine result in certain kinds of experiences, and it's it's fairly reliable um, if you're if you're using it or you're if the administration is like I am intramuscular you know, because you're injecting it straight into the body. And so it's easier to get the right, the right dose for the, the body weight of the person for, you know, certain kinds of experiences. But if you're using it more like sublingually, um, where, you know, it's a, it's a little waxy tablet that dissolves in your mouth. And so then you have to absorb it in your body and it, you know, and there's a lot of factors that influence uh, how it works. And so it's, it's much less reliable to get to those specific states, but ketamine in general is pretty reliable at, at creating what I'm going to call an out of body experience. Um, you know, in that I have experienced really uh, on a couple of, yeah. Did you experience it to the point where you were out of your body and you looked back and saw it lying there? Um, no. And that's what's, and that's an interesting aspect of this because it made me think a little bit differently about out of body experiences that that maybe they can take different forms. Uh, that's always the way that I thought about them because that's the way they're discussed is, you know, from whether it's, you know, sort of hospital research or whatnot, where people are, you know, um, you know, dying and they leave the body and then kind of can observe what's happening. Um, my experiences were a little bit different where for lack of a better term, there was no awareness that I had a body um, or that I even had a personality. Um, so the idea of Jeff and being a physical entity was completely gone. And so I, I was just a consciousness. And <laughs> I was just a consciousness observing and engaging with, um, I don't know what to call it, except sort of the, the fabric of reality. <laughs> Uh, it felt a little bit like the matrix, kind of like, you know, being in this um, energy field of sort of manifestation and 
being part of that and seeing how it all worked. Um, but having no awareness that I was Jeff. Uh, and so for me, that that's was still an out of body experience because I was just a consciousness. Some of my near death experiencers on the other side cease to care about this current life and even even care about who they were at all. Yeah. And it's interesting because there's been at least one experience that, that I've had that was kind of like this, where when I came back, you know, I, I liken it to kind of being like an avatar. You, you know, when you start coming back, it's like, oh, I have a body. Weird. Right. And it's kind of like you're kind of transitioning back into having a body again. And um, I've had this happen actually more than once where on that re-entry point, kind of feeling sad, you know, like, I don't, I really don't want to go back like that. Like, that's amazing. Like, I don't want to go like this physical body is uncomfortable and it causes trouble and anxiety and worries. And I don't, I don't want to go back to that. Like, this is amazing and blissful, you know? Yeah. And I, so, you, yeah. I was gonna say, I totally get it because so many near death experiencers are not happy about being back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, you know, more recently, a couple of experiences I've had, it's been different for me where, um, when I come back, it's, I've been able to shift into a state of more gratitude for the opportunity to get to play in this body and, uh, and have this, you know, this experience. Um, and so it's just sort of a perspective shift that it's like, well, okay, I know that this isn't the entirety of reality, this physical plane, but what a cool experience, you know? And what a cool experience to feel anxiety and to worry about money mm -hmm. and, you know, all the human things, right? It's kind of like, well, on one level, that's kind of cool, you know, uh, that we get to do that. It's a common topic that we, that we come across, and that is suffering. You know, there's so much suffering that goes on here. And why would we agree to come here and suffer? Yeah. Good question. And, you know, it's interesting because, um, you know, I know that a lot of, um, you know, people talk about this idea that, you know, we sort of form a contract of some kind to, to come back to this earth world and, and live through certain things and experience certain tragedies and whatever it is that we have to work out. Right. And you know, I don't know if, I don't know if that's true or not. I have no idea. Um, but from the glimpses that I've, and maybe it's just the perspective that I've had, um, you know, my feeling has been <laughs> that um, everything is manifesting and demanifesting with every possible configuration you could ever imagine and beyond. In fact, anything that we can imagine is potentially true in this field. It's almost like a quantum realm where everything is possible. And so, you know, it's kind of like, oh, well, how can this religion and this religion be true? Yes, they can. How can the ascended masters exist? And it's like, yes, because everything is possible in this quantum realm. It just depends on what you want to pay attention to and what you sort of focus on. And so for me, it's kind of like, oh, this human existence is just like a blip in this, you know, and time doesn't exist in that realm anyway. So it, it it's almost kind of like, oh, this is just like a little eddy in the pool of life that for us feels like 50 years. Well, for, I don't know how old you are. For me, it feels like 53 years. But it, from that perspective, it's nothing. It's nothing. It's, you know, it's just movement. It's just energy moving around. And so... You know, for me, it's kind of like, well, you know, if that's if that's the case, and, and at least that's what I experienced, it's kind of fun to be able to manifest and to manifest into this. Have you been able to now manifest more and more things in your favor, like manifest money and opportunities and things like that? Hey, maybe that's how this podcast happened. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> um you know, I, uh, I don't, 
I don't know. Um, well, let me ask it this way. Is it something okay. that you actively work on? Sort of. It, it's weird because, um, you know, I was mentioning earlier that, you know, many people talk about having a natural ability or natural talents, like either as a medium or psychic or an energy healer or whatever. And that's never been really my feeling for myself. Um, I mean, I, I can I can do all of those things, but it's not, you know, I have to work at it. I, I have to develop my skills. Um, but one of the things that I've always been really good at is manifesting. And um, and it's almost like I don't have to try. Uh, it, it just things sort of historically have happened favorably for me and in sort of a a nice consistent progression um and it's almost kind of like whatever i put my attention toward happens it, it will manifest but there's kind of a lag right it's not at least for me there's not like this instantaneous it's not like you know it's not like the secret where I'm like, I want to check for a million dollars and I come home and there's a check for a million dollars. Um, but, you know, when I put my attention towards something, usually there's about a six month lag uh, is what I've noticed. And whatever it was that I've been focusing on starts to manifest. And as long as I keep my attention there, it keeps building and developing. Um, and so you know, I, I feel, I don't know that it's, I don't know that the experience that I was discussing changed that. It feels like it's still a similar process. I don't know if that enhanced it at all. Um, maybe I don't have enough evidence yet. Now you have a book on meditation and I would like to know what meditation style do you find to be the most effective? <laughs> um, well, let me back up just a second, because so one of the things that that I tried to do in the book was categorize meditations based on how you're directing your attention. So, you know, you'll see other people categorize meditations by what you're doing, right? So, oh, it's a walking meditation. Oh, yoga is a meditation. Oh, whatever, you know, a seated meditation. I, I I categorize them differently based on, you know, how you're directing your attention, what your intention is, and what areas of the brain are affected. And when we do that, there's really four primary styles of meditation. And, you know, each one requires something a little bit different in terms of how you're using your attention and how you're using your brain. And because of that, because we have these different styles and they affect things differently, which style is is best or better for people depends on what their goals are. Um, so just as a simple example, um, you know, if somebody is struggling with, let's say, ADHD or ADHD type concerns, they have a hard time paying attention, um, maybe they're impulsive, maybe um, you know, they have difficulty with frontal lobe type skills, executive functioning kind of things. You know, the while a lot of meditations might be helpful, meditations that require you to hold your attention, focus meditation, concentration practices are going to be probably the best. And the reason for that is because you're literally exercising the same skills you're trying, you're wanting to develop. And that's the way the brain works, is if you want to get better at a skill, you have to practice it. And if you want to develop a certain part of your brain, you have to use it. And so, you know, front uh, frontal uh, focus type meditations actually require you to activate your frontal lobes. You're sustaining your attention and you're, you know, reducing attention on anything else besides that whatever your target is. If your target is your breath or a candle flame or a mantra or whatever, you're holding your whole attention there. And that requires frontal lobe activation. It's not a it's not the brain shutting down. Um, now, parts of the brain shut down because you're not thinking about yourself. You know, you're just 
focused on this one thing. And so when you do, when you do that with time, it actually improves attention skills and it reduces distractibility and it reduces, it increases your reaction time and uh, I guess reduces your reaction time. Um, and, you know, various other cognitive skills uh, that we think of as associated with the frontal lobe. So you can kind of line that out with all of the styles uh, that each of them has certain things that they're particularly good at. So, so, the, so the question, even though it, you know it, it's kind of a straightforward question, it's a little complicated because uh, it just depends. It's like, well, why why are you meditating? Why do you want to meditate? What's your goal? Um, and then we can figure it out from there. What about if you wanted to increase your own psychic abilities? <laughs> All right. Um, so this is an interesting one because. Um, you know, what, one of the things that we've kind of figured out, um, and actually in the process of writing, writing this new book, it was really where a lot of it kind of came together, that there's, there's really, let's call it three different brain regions that seem to change functioning pretty consistently um, with psychics, mediums, energy healers, and across various skills. Um, and so because we kind of know what those brain areas are, then the task is kind of like we just talked about. It's like, hmm, well, which, what types of meditations could influence those areas of the brain? And so, um, one example, so one of the areas that, uh, I think is the most interesting is the right temporoparietal junction. So the right part of the brain kind of in the back quadrant and maybe leaning over toward the ear a little bit. And this part of the brain is very interesting because one of the things that it does is creates boundaries. So when it's doing its normal job, it's creating a boundary between self and other. So, uh, you know, it's like, I'm Jeff. I live here in this little body. You're Jeff. You live over there in your body. And we're different people and we're not connected. And so what you see repeatedly with mediums and people doing spirit communication and various other kinds of work like this is that that part of the brain goes offline. Uh, it essentially shuts off. And sometimes it looks almost like a seizure. Um other times, there's just a huge increase of slow brainwave activity back there. So essentially, it's it's not doing its job anymore. And, you know, what I suspect is that that's how they're able to connect to something beyond themselves is by shutting off this part of the brain. Um, so it's almost like the brain acts as a um, filter to reduce stimuli and information. And so if we can get the brain out of the way, then we have the ability to access a whole lot more information. And some people are just better at that than others, right? They're just, which makes sense. We all have certain skills and certain abilities. And so they're able to sort of get that part of the brain out of the way. You're seeing these findings on EEGs? Yes. Hmm, cool. Yeah, very cool. And actually, one of the very first people that I um, studied showed this pattern, and that's where it first kind of showed up. And it, it took me a while to figure out what might be going on. Actually, weirdly enough, as I started investigating this part of the brain, uh, there had already been other things written about it in, re in relation to this. Um, in fact, years and years ago, uh, the media got a hold of some research related to this part of the brain and started calling it the God spot. Uh, and they were calling it that because what the research found was that if there was damage to this part of the brain through like a traumatic brain injury or something like that, that the, the people that were injured uh, became more empathic and they became more spiritual after that part of the brain was injured. And so again, they were they were better able to connect to others and to connect to something bigger than themselves. 
And so there's actually already research literature out there. Um, I just wasn't aware of it until, you know, I saw this show up in my research and was like, what the heck's going on? You know, what is, what is this part of the brain and why does it keep showing up? Um, so back to your original question <laughs> with, with my very long answer is, you know, well, what kind of meditation, right? So again, so then it becomes, well, what kind of meditations help you connect to others, right? Because in order to do that, you have to change the functioning of that part of the brain. So, so these are, you know, very often I find that guided meditations can work really well, you know, because they're helping you, um, you know, kind of explore this idea um, and connect with the idea of, can my energy body extend outside of my physical body and interact with other energies, right? Like, how does that happen? And how can we experience that? And we can do that. You can do that through guided meditations, or, you know, you can do it on your own. Just the guidance is often helpful. Um, and so, you know, we've actually got a meditation on our website that, you know, is an audio recording that, you know, if your listeners want to check it out, it's, um, it's called the net net of Indra, which is a, a Hindu concept, uh, you know, related to sort of consciousness and how consciousness works. But the meditation itself is designed to do exactly what we're talking about, um, sort of guide people in extending their energy field out beyond themselves and connecting with others, right? So disembodied others. Um, whether they're helpers or spirit guides or ancestors or unknown conscious consciousness. And, uh, you know, so it's a very heart opening kind of an experience. But at the same time, you're also uh, softening those boundaries. Is it the act of listening that's the mechanism of shutting down that region of the brain? I... I think that that is a part of it. Um, and I say that because a lot of the people that I've worked with and studied identify themselves as both mediums and psychics. And they they see those as different things, that psychic skills are different than mediumistic skills. And in fact, when you look at their brain patterns, their brain looks different when they're doing a psychic reading versus a medium reading. So, you know, even from that perspective, that's it's consistent that they're not the same thing, they're slightly different. And what many of them say is that for a psychic reading, they have to go out and get the information. They're sort of extending out. Whereas when they're doing a mediumship reading, it's more like listening, right? It's more like being receptive and allowing the information to come in. So uh, I think, yes, that to some degree, being able to uh, be receptive, shut off that left hemisphere, you know, so that you're not analyzing and interpreting and all of that, and just allowing the information to come in. I think that is a part of it. Is there a certain meditation technique that assists in manifesting? I don't know, but I should figure that out, shouldn't I? Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, you know, to be honest, I've been kind of focused on these other areas, just because that's where I've got more data. You know, I haven't really studied manifesting per se. Um, you know, whereas I have looked at these other things. And so I have an idea of what's going on in the brain and, and, you know, what might facilitate that. Um, but so yeah, maybe I need to add that to my list. Maybe that'll be my next book. Mm, yeah. How accurate is your best test subject? Mm-hmm. Yeah, great question, uh, and a tricky question, uh, because, you know, most of the research that I've done is kind of set up more in case study mode, right? And what I mean by that is, you know, I didn't set up elaborate controls where everybody has to do everything exactly the same way under the same conditions, and we ask a question, and they've got 30 seconds to respond, and, you know... Um, there's research that's been done like that, and it's valuable, but I was approaching it differently. I was approaching it more um, where assuming that all of these people that I'm working with work a little differently. 
They don't all work the same. And many of them, if they feel under pressure or they're uncomfortable in the environment, they're less successful. And so my logic was, even though from a research perspective, it looks a little sloppier, it may be more meaningful in some ways because they can actually do their job more effectively. So the point is, is that, you know, because I didn't set it up in a rigid, strict way, it's a little bit harder to measure how accurate were you in some of these different tasks. What I will say is in some of my early studies, um, I served as the subject because, again, it was kind of this semi-informal process where, you know, I'd, I'd find somebody who, uh, you know, had already been certified. And, and by certified, I mean like they'd gone through a process either through Winbridge or Forever Family Foundation where they have a very vigorous, rigorous uh, testing procedure to certify mediums. And so a lot of my subjects had already gone through that process. And so I didn't feel like I had to sort of verify that they actually knew what they were doing because they've already done that. They've already, they've already kind of proven themselves under testing environments that were much more difficult than what I could come up with. Um, so I kind of just trusted, right, that they were the real deal. Um, but, and because of that, and because of how we set things up, like I said, very often, I was the subject because we would be in an environment, I'd hook them up. And it's like, oh, we need we need you to read somebody. And it's like, well, go ahead and read me, right? It it reduces one more variable in the room, right? It's, it's just me. And I'm pretty good at keeping a, a, a stone face, right? I'd be looking at the computer, looking at the EEG, didn't smile, didn't blink, didn't answer any questions, just wrote down their responses. And which I learned is probably not the best way to do this, Um it's hard for some of the mediums to work if they're not getting any feedback at all, um, you know, which I understand. Anyway, that all being said, some of the mediums blew my mind, like some of the things they got about me that they shouldn't have known. There was no way they could have known. Um, and some of it very specific. Um, so, you know, like information about my family and my kids and about my deceased grandfather and you know, including his name, his first name, which, uh, you know, uh, you know, and his name was Giuseppe. So it's not like a name you're just going to pull out of thin air, right? You're not going to go, huh, how about uh, Joe or uh, Steve, you know? Yeah. Um, so, you know, when you, when I see those things, it's, it's fairly impressive because it's like, man, I don't know where you got that from, but, uh, you know, like, I don't even think if you searched me on the internet, you'd be able to find some of that information. Like, you know, where are you going to find that? Um, I mean, I guess it's possible somewhere, but, um, you know, we tried to control for things such as, you know, a lot of these mediums didn't even know that they were going to be doing this until like right at the moment of. And so it wasn't even like they had time to go look something up if if we were concerned about that. The other thing that I've been struck by is that the vast majority of the mediums and psychics that I've worked with have just seemed very genuine, um, you know, um, very honest people interested in the science, interested in understanding what's going on. They're as curious as I am. And so, you know, they'll volunteer, yeah, I want my brain mapped. And to me, that also doesn't seem consistent with somebody who's a fraud. Mm -hmm. You would think that somebody who was just making stuff up wouldn't want to go through that testing, you know, because it might reveal, uh, you know, that they're not, they're not doing anything. Um, but in fact, I've seen the exact opposite. I've seen people be really excited about doing this work to understand what's happening because they know, they know it's real. What other techniques or technologies have you discovered that can help us become more psychic? Yeah. So beyond, you know, meditation, I mean, there's a couple of other things that I think are worth talking about. And one of them is using uh, neurostimulation technology. 
so again, my background as a psychologist, I use a lot of um, neuromodulation and neurofeedback type technologies to try to encourage the brain into more adaptive ways of responding. Um, and so because, you know, like we talked about, we know certain regions of the brain are involved with mediumship. So we could stick with that God spot, right? Just for an example, that right temporal parietal area. And we know from research that it tends to go offline. It looks like really slow brainwave activity. Well, we can induce that. We can use something like low power, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is a lot of big words, but it's basically just pulsing low power magnetic fields in a directed way. So we can apply that to the to the outside of the head in the in the general vicinity and pulse in, you know, one hertz or three hertz uh, electromagnetic pulses, which essentially shuts that part of the brain down, or at least knocks it off of its normal rhythm. And so, you know, we've been experimenting with doing work like that to see, does that enhance the experience uh, of doing a mediumship reading? And again, some of this isn't totally new, you know, some of the work of uh, Persinger, you know, with his God helmet, uh, you know, they've been doing this for years uh, in different ways, using electromagnetic pulses to induce anomalous experiences or out-of-body experiences or things like that. So we're just trying to refine that process a bit. We've also been using audiovisual entrainment, which is using light and sound stimulation and it kind of does the same things. We can pulse lights that are built into eyeglasses and sounds and headphones to encourage the brain into certain EEG patterns. And so, um, you know, that can often be really helpful as well as a way to kind of, you know, kickstart the process. Um, so we've been using those two technologies a lot recently in some of our studies. And what I would say is what we've seen so far is that uh, it definitely seems to have an effect. Uh, however, it seems to have a greater effect with people who are already semi-tapped in. And what I mean by that is people who are already, you know, practicing their psychic skills or their mediumship skills. or So they kind of already have a base, you know, practice around that. And for those people, it seems to uh, almost kind of exaggerate things. It, it kind of like ramps it up. But what I've also seen is that people who really have no idea about any of this and they don't know what they're doing at all, uh, simply zapping the brain doesn't all of a sudden make them psychic. <laughs> right? It's like... <laughs> You got to you got to do both. You got to have some some practice and some skill, and then the technology can assist. Do you think that if people have belief systems that say that this isn't real, that that will affect it and make it where they don't have psychic experiences? Like absolutely, the, the belief can be a filter. Absolutely, uh, I, I see that as actually a huge uh, impediment to these abilities. My, my belief at, at the moment is that everybody has these abilities innately. And the problem is that as we've gotten older and more language oriented and more linear in our thinking, we've essentially closed off the ability to access that, but it's still in there somewhere. And so, you know, if you don't believe that it's possible, well, then it's not possible. I mean, the mind is extremely powerful. Um, we can override, the human mind can override just about anything. Um, and it's such a sensitive, subtle energy that we're trying to access that, you know, if you're not totally open to it, the likelihood you're going to access it is pretty small. Um, and actually, it's, it's one of the things I've been working on for myself and my own development is even though I, I believe all of this stuff and I've seen a lot of things and I've done some pretty impressive things, um, there's still part of me that has doubts and 
doesn't fully believe and doesn't think I can do it. They can do it, but I, I don't think I can do that. And even if it's a subtle little voice way back in the back there, it still influences me and it influences my ability. I'm glad that you said that. And you're the psychologist. You've got to help us overcome those limiting beliefs. Working on it. <laughs> we need your help, doctor. Well, you know, and, and, and that is an area that I want to explore more because that wasn't what I was looking for when I got into this work, right? I was interested in the brain. And, but it was funny because, I mean, again, in the process of writing that book, you learn a lot, right? You know, of when you're trying to articulate all of this, things start to become clear and you start to see things that you didn't see before. And one of those things was this issue about the role of beliefs. And, you know, some of that got into the book, but, you know, not as much as I would like. But that's an area that I want to develop further because I do think there are some really powerful tools, you know, to help us work on those belief systems and some powerful practices. You know, even things like hypnosis, um, you know, can be really helpful or, you know, or even things like um, using types of EMDR or, uh, you know, tapping uh, processes like EFT. Um, you know, so even stuff like that, uh, I think can be really useful uh, if we're if sort of really directed. But, you know, the mind is tricky. And so I feel like it's one of those things that it's like layers of an onion, right? That, you know, you you might sort of work on one belief system, but then there's another one right behind it. And, uh, you know, there's a lot to sort of overcome, I think, uh, for most of us. <laughs> what is talotropic breathwork? You know, so there's a lot of different um, bre breathwork practices out there. And most of them are derived from sort of ancient yogic practices, you know, sort of pranayama practices. Um, but holotropic breathwork was actually created, I don't remember if it was the 50s or 60s, uh, by a guy named Stanislav Grof. And he was a psychiatrist and he was doing research with LSD way back in the day when you could still do that and um, was getting great results and uh, seeing the therapeutic potential of working with psychedelics. And then, of course, the government came in and said, yeah, you can't do that anymore. Uh, and really, the way that happened was overnight, like literally, they just kind of the government came in and said, yeah, we're shutting down everything. Uh, you're done. And so, you know, his whole research program was kind of shot. So he started exploring other ways to induce altered states of consciousness. And, you know, to, to make a long story short, develop this breathing process, which is actually pretty straightforward. It, it's basically uh, taking large breaths, but kind of rapidly um, with no breaks in between. So it's a little bit of a hyperventilation kind of a uh, feeling. And, you know, so you're doing this in an environment where there's a sitter sitting next to you so that if you need anything, they can take care of you. If you have to go to the bathroom or you need a Kleenex or whatever, help you be comfortable. There's music in the background that's really loud. They call it evocative music. There's, it's intentionally designed to create certain psychological states. So whether it's tension, so things that might be discordant or feel like they're building into a crescendo that creates a feeling or, you know, peaceful space music, right. Creates a very different vibe. So they've got the music built in to kind of guide you through this process. And after you breathe this way for about, depends on the person, but we'll say 20 minutes, um, you enter a pretty heavy duty psychedelic state. Uh, you know, with no medicines or drugs at all, uh, just through the breath work. And so it can be very visual, it can be very psychologically, emotionally intense, kind of in the same way that psychedelics are. People can have, you know, out of body experiences, they can contact uh, non physical entities, all kinds of stuff can happen uh, in the same way as psychedelics. And this has been out there for, you know, 
like I said, like since the 60s or something. And it's kind of making a resurgence all of a sudden. It seems like there's more and more of these groups popping up or offshoots, people who are doing something similar. And the reason that it it, it comes up uh, in this work is because, um, you know, there's evidence that, you know, altered state experiences, so whether it's with psychedelics or, or with breath work or with something else, light and sound stimulation, whatever, um, that one of the things that those practices do is it actually creates more entropy in the brain. So it it makes the brain more flexible and more open. Um, all of those experiences do, which for most of us is a good thing because the majority of us are walking around in kind of a low state of entropy. Things are rigid. Our mental constructs are rigid, um, which is often what leads to anxiety and depression is that, you know, we have repetitive, stuck, rigid cognitive processes. And so anything that kind of loosens that up is good in that regard. Um, and so holotropic breath work is one way to do that. Um, you know, in the very first chapter of my book, I, I talk about this practice in relation to my very first uh research participant. Her name's Janet Mayer. She's a psychic medium in St. Louis. And uh, she, she did holotropic breath work. She did it twice. And after her second experience, actually it was the middle of her second experience, she sat up in the middle of the experience and started speaking a language she'd never heard before. And she had no idea what she was saying. She had no idea if she was even speaking a language. Like the stuff was just coming out of her. And, um, you know, over time she learned how to control it so that she could turn it on and off, but it continued after the session. And, you know, she'd be in the grocery store and all of a sudden she just starts speaking this thing. Uh, she didn't know if she was going crazy or what was going on. And it took her four years to find somebody who could translate it. And, uh, it was an anthropologist who also happened to be uh, a shaman from a South American tribe and identified four different tribal languages that she was channeling at different points. And he was able to, you know, translate some of these. And so, I mean, what a weird, what a weird experience, right? Like, what is like, how does that happen? Do you think that this breath work somehow activates the pineal gland? And if not, does the pineal gland play any role in psychic abilities? I mean, it certainly could, you know, I mean, we don't know that for sure. But, um, you know, there's a lot of speculation that the pineal gland uh, secretes DMT. You know, we know that it secretes melatonin. And, uh, you know, there's there's some... There's some evidence uh, beyond just conjecture that it secretes DMT, which is a very powerful psychedelic. Um, and, you know, some speculation that it may be associated with what happens when we die as well, uh, that moment of death. Um, so maybe even associated with near-death experiences is this sort of the activity of the pineal gland. Um, and so it kind of makes sense. This is a psychedelic experience. However, we got there, maybe what's happening is that, you know, we're sort of activating the pineal gland and it may be sort of for certain individuals kind of breaking loose some of those latent abilities, uh, right? You know, if you sort of, if we want to get more esoteric, right? If you, if you open your third eye, <laughs> right, if you activate your pineal gland and kind of kick your third eye into gear, you know, you may just open it and it may just be open then. And so, you know, for me, Janet's story was a really interesting one because, well, A, I mean, I'd never heard anything like that before, but it also makes me wonder how many other people out there have had similar things happen and we just don't know, We, you know, because I wouldn't have known about Janet uh, except for a, a, a weird set of circumstances that, you know, got our paths to cross. And so, 
clearly there's a potential there, right? That it's like, if you, if you create more entropy, again, I'm gonna use that language, um, you may be able to sort of break some things loose, right? And, and kind of step into more of that natural power. The breath work to me sounds similar to what some people will refer to as having a kundalini experience. Have those words or the, has that experience crossed your desk? It has crossed my desk. Um, and I don't know if it's, I mean, I think there could be a connection for some people. Um, but I also don't think they necessarily have to go together. Um, I don't, I don't know as much about sort of the Kundalini activation, uh, as certain other areas. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm reluctant to comment too much on it because, uh, you know, I'd mostly be making stuff up, but, uh, <laughs> but it makes sense to me that there could be some overlap. I think that's probably the best way to say it. Maybe there's some overlap. For somebody who's looking to start their psychic journey and become psychic, what should they start with first? Meditation, breath work, light and sound stimulation? Yes. All of the above. <laughs> um, I, I would say, you know, it's interesting because um, I'm, I'm involved in a study right now where I'm interviewing a bunch of mediums about their, how they work and, and how things, you know, how this all comes about. And 100% uh, of them have talked about the importance of meditation, uh, every single one of them. And so clearly meditation is an important aspect, you know, whether it's learning how to focus, learning how to quiet your mind, learning how to shut off the languaging part of your brain that's trying to interpret and analyze and predict everything. All of those are skills that can be developed through meditation. And that they're all central to being effective at developing your psychic and mediumship skills. So that makes sense. That makes sense that that meditation, I'm not going to say it's a prerequisite, but I think it um, is a powerful practice that could facilitate that. The other, I'll say two other things. I mean, the technology is great. And that's, I, I see that as like a, um, uh, like power tools, right? You know, like, yeah, power tools are great. They make your job a little easier, but you don't have to have a power tool, right? You know, you can use a good old fashioned handsaw, you know, rather than a, you know, <laughs> a big fancy, uh, you know, electric saw, they, they still work. Um, it may just speed things up. But the other two things are things that we've kind of talked about. One is the beliefs, you know, dealing with self-limiting beliefs and really tackling those head on. And partly I think what needs to happen is for us to be honest with ourselves, which is really hard for us to do and really look at all the places where we doubt and to start to investigate that and work with that. How can we start to shift those perspectives in a deep and meaningful way? And related to that, you know, I think one way that is effective is, is like really immersing yourself in learning about all of this stuff, reading books about this, um, watching shows about, you know, paranormal things, because it keeps it in your awareness. It makes it start to feel more possible, right? When you keep seeing it and you keep hearing about it and you keep looking at it, it starts to sort of worm its way into your subconscious that it's like, oh, this is kind of normal, right? As opposed to, you know, what we might normally think of as normal. Um, so I, th I think those two things. And then the third thing is practicing, practice, 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 practice. It, it's a skill. You know, if you want to get good at playing a musical instrument, well, you got to practice and you got to practice a lot. Say, you know, meditation, if you want to get good at meditation, well, you got to, you got to practice. And so I think these skills, especially if you're wanting to really develop them, you got to use it. Uh, and even if you feel, you know, like a fraud, and even if you feel like you don't know what you're doing and you're self-conscious about it, it's like taking those risks, taking those chances, putting yourself out there, 
and experimenting, exploring. You know, when you were talking about beliefs, what came to my mind was how Yoda would tell Luke, you can't move the fighter because you don't believe you can. George Lucas had it so right many totally, years ago. He totally had it, for sure. Yeah, you know, and, you know, and that's an area we didn't even really talk about, but it's another area that I've explored is like telekinesis and psychokinesis. And, and it's exactly true, you know, like most people starting with those practices, you know, mind over matter, trying to move things with their mind. They can do it. Pretty much everybody can do it. But what's interesting is it has to be something initially that seems really doable, something that's really easy to influence. You know, so you'll see people use a piece of aluminum foil, you know, set on a nail, right? That like the slightest air current could get it to move. And so it feels easy to get that to move. But as soon as you do something like put a glass bowl over the top of it, psychologically, it feels impossible because you just put a barrier over it, you know, but the reality is it shouldn't make any difference, you know, so from a, a George Lucas, Star Wars, Yoda perspective, it makes no difference, um, but psychologically, it makes a difference, you know, or if I try to close the door with my mind, that feels impossible. You know, but moving up a piece of aluminum foil, well, I can do that. So again, it's that psychology of it, right? Like, how do we learn to like really just embrace the experience and sort of let go of some of these ideas that we have, uh, you know, based on <laughs> based on what we think we know. I've interviewed over 500 near-death experiencers. And many of them have psychic abilities turn on after the experience. Yeah. What would you think causes that? I mean, that's a, it's an interesting question. And, and of course, you know, I've, 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 I haven't interviewed anywhere near as many uh, as you have. And, you know, that hasn't been a, a primary focus of what I've been looking at, but um but you'll see that a lot, right? And you see it with people even after a traumatic event or uh, a head injury or something like that, that all of a sudden, um, you know, things seem to unlock. And so I don't know if, if some of it is literally shifting the functionality of certain parts of the brain, kind of like we talked about with the God spot and the research where people who had damage to that part they just became naturally more empathic and spiritually connected, right? It's like, so is it possible that something happened structurally or um, or otherwise in the brain to make it just more accessible, um, you know, or is it kind of related to what we were talking about, like with the breath work where, you know, something happened that created a heightened level of entropy in the brain. It just became much more flexible and much more open, you know, and maybe the experience was just so powerful, which is what seems to be the case, right? These are really powerful experiences that it kind of overrides a lot of the, you know, you know, you hear people, right. Who are like, Oh, I was an atheist. And then this happened. And now I totally believe in God because I hung out with him, right? Or whatever it is. And so, I mean, that's a powerful experience and it may just override all of those limiting beliefs, mm -hmm. right? There's like, no, I know. I don't have to think about it. I know uh, how things work and how what reality is, right? And so it expands your perception immensely. And, you know, maybe it's as simple as that. I, you know, I don't know. It's a great question though. I'm pretty certain that you haven't thought of this and you probably don't even look at this because this is not what where you're focused. But to take it to the next level, also a significant number of the people who have had a near-death experiences now start having UFO experiences. Mm. 
And again, maybe like you're saying, that they wipe out those limiting beliefs and now they can see them. Or maybe somehow our bodies or our makeup changes energetically where they can see us among the others that are, have not. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know either, but that's a really interesting um, observation. And, you know, it reminds me a little bit of, you know, what we see in certain parts of the world where there's a lot of high strangeness. You know, so, you know, where all the Mothman stuff, you know, happens in uh, uh, Mount Pleasant, right? And, you know, not only was Mothman over there, but there's all kinds of weird UFO stuff. And there's weird uh, cryptid kinds of reports. And there's reports of cult stuff going on in the woods. And there's like every kind of weird thing you could imagine seems to be in the same area. You know, Bigfoot. And then Bigfoot's yeah. hanging out over there, right? And And so... And you see this, like certain areas, Skinwalker Ranch, right? And other places where there seems to be, uh, like, like things are open in that area for some reason. And it doesn't just open to one thing. It opens to kind of everything. Yeah. Um, and so maybe that happens in individuals as well, right? It, it doesn't just become open to one thing. It becomes open to everything. And whether that's a frequency, maybe it's a frequency match. You know, that their frequency gets altered in such a way that it's easier to tap into these other realms or these other states of reality or whatever they are. I mentioned it in the beginning that your new book, Becoming Psychic, is coming out. When is that date again? It's officially out November 7th. It's, uh, it's available for pre-order now, but uh, it'll be shipped on November 7th. Well, after watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you, of course. Are you open to that? And if so, how can they reach you? <laughs> yes, I am open to it. And uh, I do my best to respond to everybody as quickly as I can. Um, and so the easiest way, way to get, get me is probably email. And I can be reached at Jeff, J-E-F-F, -F, at neuromeditationinstitute.com. It's a long email address, but that's the best one. I'm pretty sure that there are a lot of psychic people that watch this podcast. So are you looking for new research subjects? Great question. Um, sometimes. Uh, so it depends on what study it, I'm working on at the moment. Um, but what I would say is that if there are people listening to this podcast who uh, feel like they might be uh, interested in participating in future research, you know, please shoot me a message and let me know. I may not be able to to work with you immediately, but there's always new projects coming up. And so uh, it's always helpful to have a list of people that I've not worked with before who, um, you know, are interested and open to, you know, kind of a scientific exploration. So I would say, please send me a message and let me know. And, you know, then we'll keep a list and then we can get in touch in the future. Well, do you have anything else that you're working on that you want us to know about? Um, I mean, some of the, <laughs> some of the things that I'm working on, I, I can't talk about mm -hmm. yet. Okay. And so it sounds, it sounds very mysterious and I don't mean to be mysterious, but um, uh, you know, NDAs and whatnot. Uh, I, I have to sort of be semi careful about what I say. Um, one of the next studies that I'm really interested in exploring is really investigating in a little bit more of a careful, thoughtful way, um, how these technologies that we've been talking about, the audio visual entrainment, the low power pulsed electromagnetic frequencies, um, how effective those can be at, uh, helping people access these, these other states of consciousness. And so uh, that's probably the next study that I'm going to be really uh, looking to expand. All right. Well, before we wrap it up, can you leave us with one last positive message? <laughs> one last positive message. I guess, um, I guess what I would say is that
and I mentioned this earlier, but you know, I didn't come into this uh, just as a full out believer in in all things weird. And to be honest, I'm still skeptical. You know, just because somebody shows up in my office and says they're a psychic, my first my first approach is kind of like, well, we'll see. Um, and so I I still have my scientific background, and um, and so where I'm going with this is even with my kind of natural skeptical attitude, um, I'm convinced at this point that all of us, everybody has the potential to access whatever it is you want to access, um, whether it's psychic abilities or mediumship or energy healing or telekinesis, we all have this potential. And so for me, that's really encouraging. It's, it's not like there's just a special group of people that, you know, can do this. There's a special group of people that have natural ability, but it doesn't mean we can't learn. It doesn't mean we can't uncover those latent abilities. And so anyway, I think, I think for me, that's, that's very encouraging. And I hope that's encouraging to people listening is that, you know, we can all do this. It just takes a little bit of work, a little bit of practice, a little bit of help. <laughs> Dr. Tarrant, thank you for your message. And thank you for being my guest. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.